Otherwise, you will be harmed. Okay, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's our fall 2020 GS symposium, and we have six students presenting their research. For those of you that don't know, as part of the GS degree requirement, all majors must conduct a faculty mentored research project, write a thesis, and publicly present their results and answer questions. So today our presenters are gonna be sharing their research results and then also answering questions from the audience. As far as rules for today's symposium, please uh, keep your microphone muted at all times um, until the appropriate time. Please also hold all chat window uh, comments until after each presenter has completed their presentation. At the completion of each presentation, everyone has the opportunity to briefly unmute their microphone and collectively congratulate the speakers. And after that brief congratulation, the speaker will take questions. Um, questions can be delivered either by unmuting your microphone and addressing the speaker directly, or you can enter uh, your question into the chat window. Okay. All right, um, so we will get started. Our first speaker today is Arisa Barcinas, and the title of her talk is Evaluating the Barriers Faced by Native Hawaiian and Pacific Island Undergraduate Students in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And her mentor is Barb Bruno. Arisa? Good morning, everybody. My name is Arissa Barcinas, and my topic is on evaluating the barriers faced by Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So here's an overview of what I will be talking about today, starting with the motivation behind why I decided to do this project. Now, STEM affects every aspect of Pacific Islanders' life, increasingly so as Pacific Islands face immediate threats from climate change. However, NHPI populations are extremely underrepresented in STEM fields. The main objectives and questions that guided my study are first, what are the barriers to NHPI students in STEM? Next, I wanted to understand which of these barriers are most prevalent to NHPI undergraduates in STEM at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And lastly, I attempt to address and dismantle these prevalent barriers. To do this, I first conducted a literature review to identify the barriers. I then conducted a survey to evaluate the barrier prevalence at UH Manoa. I then analyzed my survey results and used these results to create a website in attempts to dismantle these barriers. Following my literature review, I was able to identify five main barriers being cultural barriers, awareness and exposure to opportunity, geographic barriers, K through 12 education and financial barriers. I split cultural barriers into three sub barriers being family, cultural disconnect, and identity and stereotype threat, which I will be discussing individually. Um, following the identification of these barriers in the literature, I then aim to answer the question, which of these barriers are most prevalent to NHPI undergraduates in STEM at UH Manoa? To do this, I conducted a survey containing 29 survey items distributed among the five barriers. Um, the survey utilized five point Likert scale, multiple choice and open ended questions. I was able to get 25 respondents for this survey. Um, most of the respondents identified as Native Hawaiian, female, and um, with their intended major as civil engineering. So to analyze the results of my survey, I first had to do a quantification of my Likert scale responses. So I rated my Likert scale responses on a scale of one to five. For example, the agreement survey items, one being strongly disagree to five being strongly agree. Um, this allowed me to perform a descriptive statistical analysis in which I was able to find the means, medians, modes, and standard error of the means for each question. Um, however, after doing that, I was unable to statistically differentiate between the means that I found and um, because of this lack of statistical significance, I will instead be presenting a possible interpretation of the means. 
So first I looked at, at family as a barrier in which student mean responses conveyed that their family was influential in obtaining a college degree, however, not necessarily in their decision to pursue STEM. Next, I looked at cultural disconnect as a barrier. Um, students, um, despite whether students felt that their classes were grounded in local contexts and communities, they still felt that their learning was relevant and that they knew how to apply it outside of the classroom environment. Next, I looked at identity and stereotype threat. Um, despite how students felt that their ethnicity and cultural background influenced their interactions and decisions, they still showed strong agency and control over their studies and success in STEM. I then looked at awareness and exposure to opportunity in which students conveyed the importance of mentors and role models in their in helping them be aware of the different career paths and opportunities available to them after obtaining their degree. Next, I looked at K through 12 education in which students conveyed that their K through 12 education was both important and effective at preparing them for their for their college level STEM courses. Next, I looked at financial barriers. Um, obtaining a college degree is a large financial burden for many people. Um, I first asked about their sources, student sources of funding. Um, in which most students responded that their primary source of funding was scholarships and grants. However, the mean responses um, of the, my Likert scale questions still conveyed that students worried about not having enough money to pay for school. This may indicate a need for more um, scholarship information. Lastly, I asked or I addressed geographic barriers. Um, I asked students if they chose UH Manoa due to its proximity to home, to which um, their, the average response was neither agree nor disagree. Um, however, for many Pacific Islander students, obtaining a college education does mean moving far away from home. Next, I the last question on my survey was an open ended survey question in which I informed students that I was planning to make a website to um, aid in an HPI success in STEM and asked students what kind of information would be helpful to see. Um, on the left of this table, you can see the resources that they indicated in the responses and how many students indicated this resource. Um, the most common resources requested were scholarships, undergraduate opportunities, tutoring information and resources, and NHPI stories. Because I was unable to find statistical significance in my Likert scale analysis, I used this open-ended survey um, question to guide my website. So using the, the most requested resources in the open-ended question, I created a website that contained scholarship undergraduate opportunities, tutoring information, and NHPI stories. This website was intended for NHPI undergraduates in STEM at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, the NHPI stories contain individuals who are Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, um, Pacific Islanders in STEM fields. Um, my research did have several limitations, a few of which I'm going to discuss. First was the distribution of the survey. To maintain student privacy, I was unable to obtain individual contact information for, for the people within my target population. So instead I distributed my survey through seven listservs and one social media channel whose subscribers were part of my target population. Um, due to my limited distribution of my survey, um, I had a resulting small sample size. Um, because of my small sample size, my results may not be a representation of the entire population. Next was my Likert scale quantification. So to perform analysis, I I assigned each Likert scale response a value of one through five. Um, however, by doing this, I assumed that the distance between each response was the same 
for example, the distance between strongly agree and agree was the same as the distance between agree and neither agree nor disagree. Um, however, this may not hold true in the mind of the respondents. Next was um, limitations to my website. Because this website was an, um, was an individual initiative, it was not brought on by any UH organization and therefore may not be easily accessible through UH by the students, as well as the information in my website um, was current to this semester and may not hold its relevance without proper updating. Some suggestions for future work would first be a more collaborative survey within UH and the UH STEM departments to allow for a better representation of the population, as well as a better understanding of how these barriers are prevalent in the STEM programs. Next would be the expansion of my website um, created in this study. Um, by having this website adopted by a UH organization, it would be easily accessible to students through UH, as well as have potential to be continuously updated and maintain its relevance. So in this study, I was able to identify the barriers in the literature. I then conducted a survey to investigate the prevalent barriers in which my results from the survey I used to create a website in attempts to help dismantle the barriers to the students at UH Manoa. Thank you. Hey, if you, uh, the audience would like to unmute, they can give their appreciation for Risa's talk now. Great job, Arissa. <clears throat> yes, awesome. Well done, Good job, Arissa. Thank you. Great great done. Very nice. Stuff. Very interesting stuff. Okay, we'll now enter the question uh, phase of Arisa's presentation. So either you can unmute and ask her directly, uh, or you can type in the chat window and we will monitor that. I was wondering if um, the website will still be maintained or continue to be maintained and updated with resources. So I personally would not maintain it. So that's why in my suggestions for future work, I would um, recommend that this tool or something similar be made available through UH so that it can be constantly updated as the resources change um, semester to semester. Thank you. Uh, hey, Aris, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is Yao. I'm from the Assessment and Curriculum Support Center. So when you're talking about statistical significance, what kind of statistical significance are you looking for? So I was looking to um, be able to find, like, to differentiate between the means for the questions asked in each barrier. Um, but oh. my error bars were very big. Um, my standard errors were large, so I wasn't able to find any. You're trying to identify what are the top barriers identified by the students. Okay. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um, and um, I mean, one small suggestion would be you could consider non-parametric analysis because Likert scale, they're not um, interval scale, scale uh, data. They're more like a ranking or categorical. So. You, you could you could try a non-parametrical analysis where looking at the differences in percentages of students who choose top two categories. Just a small suggestion. Thank you. Hi, Russ. It's uh, Bob Richmond. Uh, really nice job. And um, in terms of continuity for your website, I had a look. It's nice that, um, again, being able to show success is always a great thing to do. And maybe, uh, have you ever connected with anybody at SACNIS? Or certainly we would be interested in linking it with our regional STEM program for the Pacific Islands and maybe having your site linked to ours if you'd like. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, I haven't reached out to anybody about um, the website yet. 
Okay. And just one minor question too. Do you see some way of being able to reach the K through 12? Because, you know, as you brought up, that is a major barrier that by the time students figure out that STEM would be a good thing to do, that it's within their capacity. Um, they're far enough along that they sometimes have to backtrack and get some coursework. Any final thoughts on how you might be able to engage that K through 12 pipeline um, more towards the K through six or K through eight, uh, where these fundamental uh, decisions are so important? Um, I feel like in reaching um, primary school um, audience would be mostly just an increase in outreach to the schools, um, encouraging um, more STEM curriculum or a deeper STEM curriculum, um, more hands-on science like outreach to expose students to um, the different aspects of STEM and get them interested early on. Great, thanks very much, nice job. Thank you. We have time for one more question, if there's one more question. Okay, great job, Arisa, well done. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our next speaker now, um, Anthony Barrow. The uh, title of his uh, presentation is an investigation of uh, CO2 signals caused by weather disturbances in Mamala Bay. His mentors are Seth Buschensky and Chris Sabine of the Oceanography Department. Anthony, take it away. All right. Hi everyone, um, my name is Anthony Barrow. Um, I'm gonna be doing a talk on an investigation of CO2 signals caused by weather disturbances in Mamala Bay. And my mentors are Dr. Seth Bushinsky and Dr. Christopher Sabine. Um, in this presentation, I'm gonna go over an introduction and a little bit of a background, go over the methods used, and I'm gonna talk about the uh, data and results of two Kona storms, one in July, 2016, and one in December, 2017. And then I'll give a little bit of a, this summary and I will open it up for questions. So since the start of the industrial revolution, atmospheric CO2 concentrations have continued to rise. As they continue to rise, 5% um, of that CO2 is observed by, absorbed by Earth's oceans through the air-sea gas exchange, um, through the air-sea interface, that's a pressure gradient that concentrations along the pressure gradient from high, high to low. Um, once in the ocean, seawater interacts with the CO2 and um, these processes are beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, but since the start of combustion fuel, um, using fossil fuels for combustion, uh, the patterns in the ocean have changed a little. Um, there used to be a primary source to the atmosphere and now the oceans are seeming to be a primary sink of the atmosphere. CO2 dynamics differ in the open ocean and the coastal waters um, because of interactions with land-based processes. Um, as anthropogenic CO2 emissions continue to rise, it is important to maintain a contemporary understanding of coastal CO2 dynamics. So some factors um, affecting CO2 cycles. Hawaii's coastal waters are very dynamic and the CO2 fluctuations are affected by many different factors. For the scope of this project, it was assumed that temperature and biological process are the dominant factors influencing the CO2 fluctuations. Um, if you look at the figure on the left, it explains how temperature is um, the temperature relationship to PCO2. So for every degree Celsius change in seawater, um, PCO2 changes by 4.32%. Um, in order to remove the, the biological component out of the data, this equation here was used. And then the biological component um, related to the CO2 cycles is that, you know, um, photosynthesis and respiration, photosynthesis uses up the CO2 and respiration releases it. Um, both of those can be affected by um, weather events in Hawaii. And I want to talk a little bit about 
um, trade winds. So if you look over at this figure here, um, north the typical wind pattern is northeastern trade winds. Um, they, when they reach the island, moist air, um, if you look over in this graph, um, rises when it hits the Ko'olaus and causes orographic lift and orographic rainfall, resulting in um, generally more rainfall on the windward side than on the leeward side, the, which includes our study area. And if you look back over here, you can see the Kona storm directions. Um, this tends to drop more or precipitate more water in our watershed than the usual trade wind um, storms. So our, our study area is affected more by um, Kona wind weather. Um, this is our study area. This is a map of Oahu. Our study area is right in here on the south shore near Waikiki. This entire watershed right here is um, the Alawai watershed. It's made up of three watersheds, Alawai, the Manoa, and the Palolo. And all of this water drains, most of this water, I think 42% of this water drains into uh, the Alawai Canal, which is fed by tributaries, including this site here with the star where I got my stream flow data. This site right here is the MPDC Manoa Palolo Drainage Canal, also man-made. And this is where there's a, a USGS stream flow sensor. So those connect to the Alawai here, which leads to the mouth of Mamala Bay and um, our buoy site where we got all of our CO2 data is located right here. Um, on the buoy, the buoy is moored to the seafloor and attached to the buoy are different sensors, but the ones we're gonna, um, that were useful to us was the map CO2 sensor. So the methods, um, these two plots over here show data that I got from the PMAIL site on the top and the PACIU site on the bottom. Both of these data sets are from that same water quality buoy at the Alawai. And this graph here is data that I got from the USGS site. And again, that sensor is located at MPDC. So I um, downloaded data from all these sites and I compiled them and analyzed them to see what, what the effects of those um, storm events had on the PCO2 cycle. Um, table one shows that in a previous study done um, by other researchers, the uh, minimum um, PCO2 in units um, atmosphere was 302, the maximum was 514, and the mean was 389. In our study, um, the minimum was 322, the maximum was five, 554, the mean was 401. And when I was identifying the signals, I was looking for signals that were either above or below my standard deviation from the mean. If I can go back real quick. Um, so when I chose the sites, I chose this area here and I looked at the different um, signals that you could see. So this figure here um, shows the, the typical daily diurnal cycle in the bay of um, PCO2 and sea surface temperature. Um, PCO2 in the orange, you can see that um, overnight, PCO2 rises to its maximum level, which sometime in the morning, and then decreases throughout the day due to um, photosynthesis, but increase through the night due to respiration. This is opposite of the trend you see in the, the temperature, which um, increases throughout the day and then decreases through the night. This um, also leads to the assumption that it's most the uh, the PCO2 cycle is mostly dominated by um, biological processes, since you see the two opposite trends of the sea surface temperature and the PCO2. Um, so for the July Kona storm, see that um, winds changed on the 24th from the typical northeastern directions to southerly directions. Discharge was indicated um, <clears throat> late, uh, early in the morning. Um, seen in this brown line here. Uh, the black line is normalized PCO2 and the blue line is observed PCO2. So with this, you can see the, the, the signal in the PCO2 during the, the rain event and also the normalized PCO2 trend following. So this kind of tells me that, um, kind of tells the data kind of shows that uh, there was a strong temperature effect. As the next day, you see a spike in the CO2 and let me go to this graph. All right, so this graph is showing this, 
the same PCO2 and the same um, normalized PCO2. But this graph also has the salinity and the temperature. You can see all three salinity, normalized PCO2 and PCO2 and temperature all decrease during the signal, um, leading to the assumption that this um, temperature decrease and possibly the salinity decrease strong enough to affect the PCO2 signal. But the next day, you see another signal, but this time it's a high one. And this signal also correlates with the normalized PCO2 and the sea surface temperature. But I also, I suspect that uh, bio biology was also influenced by that storm. Um, this graph is a little bit different than what you'll see in the December storm, which I'll show you next. So again, you see um, the winds change direction, southerly winds instead of um, northerly trade winds. There was a lot of precipitation. Um, discharge increase online again, um, coincides with the PCO2 decrease and the normalized PCO2 decrease, telling, me, um, telling us again that the data is showing uh, a strong um, effect on this signal. The next day, however, um, there was another strong um, PCO2 low signal. These two signals were actually the, the lowest signals of the data set. And when you look at the normalized PCO2, the black, you see that it is opposite again of the PCO2 observed. So this is another um, strong indicator that it's probably a biological response to the heavy storm event. Shows the same thing, um, the salinity on the top, the normalized PCO2, PCO2 observed and the sea surface temperature all matching. And then the next day it flipped back opposite. So biological. And then for both, um, when you compare both of them, you can see that after the disturbance, there was a biological effect the next day, but they both returned to um, their usual trends, the cycles on the next day, or at least two days after the, the storm. So in summary, um, the diurnal cycle is dominated by biological processes. Uh, weather disturbances cause signals and CO2 data from both temperature changes initially, but also from biological responses to the weather event as seen in the signals after the rain events occurred. Coastal CO2 is highly variable due to the effects of the land-sea interactions. Map PCO2 buoy monitoring allows us to study short-term changes in the CO2 cycle. Weather events can be identified by high or low signals in the CO2 data. And again, biology dominates the PCO2 cycle in Mamala Bay stronger than temperature change, except when that temperature change is sudden and large as seen in the data from the two Kona storms. Uh, acknowledgements, just want to say thanks to my mentors, Dr. Bushinsky and Dr. Sabine, and to um, my advisor, Dr. Idri, to all my GS professors and classmates and everybody else. Thank you. Um, question. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, so if everybody, if you'd like to unmute, congratulate Anthony on his presentation. Ms. Hi, Donna. Anthony. Hello. Luis, Hello. good job. Very Thank good you. job, brother. Yeah. Outstanding, Anthony. Congratulations. Proud of you, brother. Fantastic, Anthony. Okay, so um, floor is open for questions for Anthony now. So you can either unmute and ask directly, or you can enter a question into the chat box. Yeah, hi Anthony. This is uh, this is Jim. Uh, nice job. I had a question about the, um, you know, you notice this diurnal signal in uh, the PCO2, and you should be at the biological activity. Is that? Um, I, I wonder if you can separate out the the light portion of that versus temperature versus nutrients, because I think that buoy does have uh, turbidity on there, right? Or maybe not. Yes, uh, look at that yes. At oh, sorry, were you finished? Yeah, I was just wondering if you looked at the turbidity at all. Well, we looked at the turbidity and what happened with, it was down for one of the signals. 
So I, I didn't end up using it for the project. Like um, there was no available um, turbidity data for it was the July storm, I believe. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, as, as you know, living here, sometimes you get these storms that can be very close by and have a clear sky right next, right next door. And, you know, that if maybe what we need to do is try and get that turbidity sensor back up on that, that mooring to see if this is flushing out of the alloy or raining right on top. Oh, it's, it's back up. It's just um, for that event, I didn't have the data. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Anthony, can I ask a question, sir? Yes. Hi. So as far as I understand, you already know, there will be the disturbances, the weather pattern changing, hurricanes becoming stronger. Uh, yes. It's going to be lifted up a, a little bit more. In terms of frequency, uh, we don't have a a better data to draw a better conclusion to that. But for the audience right now, we pretty much all know what's a disturbance in our wedding, what's going to come up. At least we have a better idea with the model, with the modeling the uh, scientific community has provided so far. But one question I would you like to ask from your perspective is, what would be your message for an audience that does not have it's not considered higher education in a higher education level. What would be your message? Like if you go in the public or into a community that people are clueless, what would be your message for those people? I'm just wondering, it's good to know. That's it, that's my uh, question. Well, I mean. Um, How would you approach to inform to those people? How would be your main message to them? To me, I'm okay for the audience that's there with you. They, they all grasp it. But what about the audience in the community that if you go trying to reach a program to educate the masses, what would be your approach? What would be your message in that term? That's what I'm asking. How would you do? Um, I guess I would, I would do it just like this. And then I would ask, are there any questions? And talk to people individually and answer their questions as they come. OK, that's fine. That's good. Good, thank you. Anthony, I have a question. Yes. So um, I know in the, especially in the early stages, you spent a lot of time, you know, looking at different uh, parameters, trying to see if there were relationships, so on and so forth. Um, if you had, if you had a, another six months, um, I'm, not, I'm not implying you need, <laughs> you need to do six months of work, but if you did, um, do you think you would continue to try to uh, flesh out some of the details on what you've already found, or would you want to look at some of the other potential relationships that you, you kind of looked at a little bit, but this was the most promising. Would you want to go back to some of those? I think I would want to like look at like what Jim said with um, turbidity. I would want to look at the chlorophyll and um, correlate those together with our signals as well. But just ran out of time it's beyond beyond the scope. So I used um, biological processes and temperature as my, I guess, drivers of the CO two cycle for this project. Okay. Thank you. All right, any other questions for Anthony? Talking to us about finding ocean giants using species distribution modeling to advance our understanding of the giant squid. Uh, his mentor is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Drazen of the Oceanography Department, Sean. Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as just said, uh, I my thesis project was uh, is titled Finding Ocean Giants, uh, where I looked uh, to advance our understanding of the giant squid. So a little bit of background on this very elusive uh, uh, species. This is one of the only 
high quality images we have of Archiduthis in its natural habitat. Um, so why should we care about uh, this organism? Uh, the Archiduthis is a large high trophic level predator. They get to or a lot of the adult specimens weigh in at around 200 kilograms. And by all available information, they get to that size relatively quickly. They do so by eating a lot. Um, that this is significant because they have been noted to be present in multiple fisheries uh, from Atlantic cod up in the North Atlantic down to uh, orange ruffy and hokey fisheries uh, in areas around New Zealand and Southeast Australia. And so the presence of this large hydrophic level predator uh, in these systems that thus far has gone uh, basically uncharacterized uh, could have significant implications for uh, improving management. Um, its distribution has largely been recognized as uh, mesopelagic uh, vertically in the water column, which is a depth of 200 to 1,000 meters roughly. Um, and uh, as uh, human activity continues to sort of advances in its interaction with the deep sea, understanding how this top level predator in that environment, uh, in that environment, how we interact with it and how it interacts with us, uh, will could be become more significant uh, with time. A little bit of our history of Archituthis, of our understanding of it. The species was originally described in 1857 in the North Atlantic, uh, but it has been reliably recorded and spoken about in cultures uh, spanning a globe um, for centuries before that. Despite it being well known for this time period, it remains largely unknown uh, due to the inaccessibility of its habitat and the general elusiveness of the organism itself. They are large, they can detect disturbances from distance and they can get out of the way very, very quickly. Um, and so the distribution of the species remained largely unknown beyond a general global distribution. Uh, this is a sort of early attempt uh, to describe the species distribution. In an original, they split it into these three subspecies, although recent genetics work has split this up, but a broadly North Atlantic, North Pacific, and Southern Ocean distributions. Keep this in mind, we'll come back to it later. Um, and so sort of the questions that I was attempting to address is really advancing what the, uh, using more modern techniques to try to address what is the distribution of giant squid in the global oceans and further using, uh, further advancing what sort of environmental variables are significant to the ecology of giant squid, figuring out what kind of habitats uh, it uh, inhabits, as well as being able to infer potentially some components of its biology as a result. Um, and so how can we address this? Uh, we, I used species distribution modeling, a quick background of what species distribution modeling is. Uh, we collect uh, occurrences of the species in question, select a suite of environmental variables across the range we're interested in modeling, um, that importantly, variables that are significant uh, to the biology of the species, preferably. Uh, and then we can uh, statistically use species distribution modeling by using these occurrences and these variables to predict where the species is likely to occur. The specifics of my approach, we use uh, a program called Maxent. It's an R-based species distribution modeling program. The reason Maxent was selected was because it allowed for a presence-only occurrence data approach. Uh, it is, we can say definitely where Architeuthis has occurred. It is, uh, we cannot say a definitely where its absence is due to its elusive nature and inaccessible habitat. Um, and we had a global distribution of a suite of variables. Uh, in model development, we collected our occurrence data uh, from a couple of online databases, specifically the Glo Global Biodiversity Information Facility and the Ocean Biodiversity Information System. Um, the occurrences that were used in the model are pictured here, plotted on the left. Uh, these uh, occurrences you can see are distributed globally, although there are certainly a handful of ag uh, aggregations. Um, our selected environmental variables included uh, sea surface temperature. Temperature is known to be a significant factor uh, limiting the ecological range of uh, ocean species. Uh, net primary productivity, as uh, we hypothesized that uh, a high level predator likely would need a great deal of primary productivity to support it. Uh, a suite of uh, 
uh, nutrient concentrations at the surface uh, to capture sort of a similar uh, scope of net primary productivity from a different angle, as well as uh, mesopelagic oxygen concentrations in order uh, as uh, low oxygen zones are known to be uh, limiting to some organisms, especially in the mesopelagic due to our oxygen minimum zones. So with those environmental variables and occurrences, this is our result of the model. A quick rundown of uh, this color bar describes the likelihood of occurrence. So the very dark colors predicts uh, low or no likelihood of occurrence for the species, up to the red where it predicts a very high likelihood of occurrence occurrence of the species. The white dots are uh, occurrences that were used in training the model. Uh, and the uh, purple dots, which are 30% that were randomly selected and set aside, were used uh, to test the model. And that training and test, this is a uh, max n generated sensitivity versus specificity curve. Um, the, basically what this means, this black line uh, is what the curve would look like if the model did no better than predicting a totally random distribution um, with the, an area under the curve of 0 0.5. The red line uh, is constructed with the, the training data. And then the real uh, test of the model's robustness occurs uh, with this blue line, which is the, a sensitivity versus specificity as the error that occurs with that 30% we set aside. Um, it ranges from uh, the area under the curve, you, if you need it to be above 0 0.5 to have any descriptive power, and the closer to one you are, the more descriptive it is. Uh, and with a area under the curve of 0 0.853, uh, it suggests that our model has significant descriptive power for these occurrences. Then going through, uh, teasing apart further the importance of each the, the variables that we used, this is a function where we uh, ran the model without, uh, uh, well, the, the red bar at the bottom is the uh, area under the curve for all of the variables. So this it is directly the blue line on the, the previous graphic. And then the model was run uh, with, without uh, each variable and then with only each variable. The significance is that the, the sort of light blue uh, the more loss relative to the red bar, the more significant the variable. And the dark blue, the greater each bar is, the uh, more significant that variable is. In both instances, both sea surface temperature and net primary productivity were the most significant variables. However, there's a little bit further of as the, the um, maxent is generating the model, it uh, records the percent contribution each variable has to the uh, or to the model's development. Uh, a uh, and here we see that mesopelagic oxygen, despite having a lo relatively low descriptive power on its own, when used in conjunction with the other variables, uh, includes a relatively a, or is the second most important contributing variable. Uh, then we go through a number of generated. Um, response curves to these variables. This uh, is for sea surface temperature uh, in degrees Celsius. So generally, the uh, Architeuthis prefers warmer temperatures up until a threshold around 26 degrees Celsius when there's a significant drop off. Uh, this is notable of uh, Architeuthis has never been uh, recorded in equatorial regions between 15 degrees north and south of the equator. Uh, which uh, is represented in this curve. Then for net primary productivity in a, a units of uh, grams of carbon per meter squared per year, uh, we see a very strong threshold response of uh, which supports our original hypothesis that Architeuthis would need a, a, a lot of primary productivity to support such a large active organism. Um, of which there are uh, bands of higher productivity that uh, are associate that are associated with uh, these conditions, and then with mesopelagic oxygen, we see uh, most significantly a, a similarly strong response of uh, low mesopelagic oxygen uh, is uh, appears to exclude or. Architeuthis has a negative response 
to very low mesopelagic oxygen, suggesting it will not perform well in oxygen minimum zones, which uh, are in pronounced ones are in the North Indian Ocean and the Eastern Tropical Pacific, and a less pronounced one in the equatorial Atlantic. Um, then sort of combining so the primary model with all of our environmental variables together and the occurrences plotted on it, we can sort of look at some of the major trends of such as the Gulf Stream, a relatively warm high productivity region, which, which supports, uh, which appears to predict a likelihood of occurrence there. This follows in several other similar conditions in the North Pacific and uh, other regions that have these warm boundary currents. Um, and then the uh, uh, areas of uh, Arctic is predicted to be less likely to occur are regions with strong oxygen minimum zones like the Eastern Tropical Pacific and the North Indian, uh, with the exception of the equatorial Atlantic, where it is predicted that Arctic may occur, uh, despite no observations in that region due to equatorial upwelling. So as stated, uh, Arcatuthis appears to prefer these warm, very highly productive systems. Uh, these often associate with Western boundary currents. So the, the Gulf Stream, the Kuroshio Current, the Eastern Australian Current, um, as well as being sensitive to our oxygen minimum zones. And then there's that interesting, in the Atlantic, equatorial distribution of predicted for the species, which while Arcatuthis has not been uh, identified in that region, it's not been observed there, um, there is significant potential for the fact that these re uh, some of the region or these equatorial regions have significantly less effort trying to identify uh, Arcatuthis uh, or significantly less effort in that region. As a result, we uh, it's there, the potential absolutely exists that Arcatuthis has simply gone undetected in the region, and it remains an area of investigation. Uh, for future work, uh, it was sort of a joke whenever I started the project that uh, we an inevitable conclusion was that we would need more occurrences, more even occurrences spread across the globe as uh, the occurrences are largely aggregated in regions where they occur as bycatch and deep, more deep sea fisheries. Um, and, but getting more occurrences, it would be an extremely resource intensive process. However, with new eDNA techniques that uh, were published very, very recently, a group of researchers in Japan successfully uh, sequenced uh, Arcadutus DNA from a water sample, which has opened up a whole new world of being able to search for Arcadutus across the globe. Um, and using this and others, we can pursue sort of finer regional uh, and time scale uh, investigations as this model is very coarse, both in uh, geographic range and uh, time scale, whereas there's anecdotal and some published evidence that Arcatuthis engages in migrations and others uh, sort of short time uh, opportunistic movements. Um, with these investigations, we can begin to try to characterize the impact the species has on uh, potential fisheries that it overlaps with. And thank you, that's my presentation. Okay, if you'd like to unmute, you can, and congratulate Sean on his presentation. Good job, Sean. Nice job, Sean. Nice job, Yay, awesome job. Sean. Nice. Go squid job. Good job, buddy. Good job, Sean. Good really job. good. Well done. Okay, have some questions for Sean? Uh, I have a quick question, Sean. Were you able to find any linkages between um, uh, Arcatuthis distribution and maybe human practices that are occurring in the area and why humans are uh, coming into contact with Arcatuthis in uh, those hotspot areas? Yeah, so a lot of the sort of since the 90s, there's been a, a significant uptick in the occurrences of Arcatuthis. And so some of those are definitely represented here in the model of um, 
like especially in uh, around Southeast Australia and New Zealand, there's a hokey fishery there uh, and there was an orange roughy fishery. And well, though uh, that human activity into that, I think I mentioned er early on uh, as people are engaging more and more or in investing in engaging in the mesopelagic uh, and using resources there. And it has increased the um, sort of incidents of encounters with uh, the species. Great, thanks. I have a question for you. Um, this is Angela, which is Donna. Um, I'm curious to know what went into your choices of your test and your training sites. Were those randomly generated or did you make choices? For those, for those sites? The test and training sites were randomly selected from, the, um, from, from our occurrence data. Okay, thank you. Hey, Sean, this is Jim. I'm, I'm curious about this um, relationship to sea surface temperature with a species that presumably spends most of its time well below the, the sea surface. And did, did you look at, maybe you don't have enough subsurface temperature data or maybe something like mixed layer depth as a variable rather than, rather than SST? Yeah, that was something that we, or I started tackling very early in the project of it, um, sea surface temperature uh, when we're on at various stages during the model had significantly more descriptive power than um, the any other temperature layers that I attempted to include in the model. Um, so I'm not wholly certain uh, for the reasons why, although certainly there's some, um, Architeuthis is a very mobile organism and how shallow it may forage is, I think, still very poorly characterized. So whether or not it, um, it uses vertical habitat much shallower than previously characterized is, I think, uh, something that needs to be investigated, especially as it appears sea surface temperature holds uh, some significant descriptive power in their distribution. Yeah, it's interesting. Thanks. Of course. Good question. We have time for one more. If there's one more, okay. Great job, Sean. Well done. Thank you, everybody. So our next speaker is uh, Andrew Tokuda. Uh, he's going to be talking about food webs in Hadel trenches. Uh, his mentor is also Jeff Drazen from the Oceanography Department. Andrew, take it away. All right, uh, give me a sec. Can everybody see the presentation? Okay, awesome. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, or more so good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Takuda, and uh, my project revolves around characterizing food webs and Edo trenches. So for this project, I particularly looked at the Mariana and Kermatic trenches, which are the world's first and fifth deepest trenches, uh, respectively. So Edo trenches are widely acknowledged as a final frontier of oceanographic sciences. They range from 6,000 to 11,000 meters, which results actually in immense pressure. And uh, although they represent only less than 1% of the global ocean area, it is surprising for the fact that they represent actually 45% of the ocean depth gradient. And Hato trenches, as you can see to the right over here, uh, even if you would flip the common cruising altitude of your everyday jetliners, which is pretty high, uh, the world's deepest trenches, such as the Mariana Trench uh, shown over here, uh, would surpass it in depth. So these are obviously extreme habitats. Which takes us to why do we study these trenches? 
So these trenches are very dynamic habitats as represented in this diagram over here. So first of all, uh, it's very deep. So this results again in immense pressure, but also they have this V-shaped structure which concentrates nutrients. And therefore there are a lot of studies showing that biomass actually increases with depth of trench. When usually you would expect in deep sea for biomass to decrease because of increasingly unavailable food. So Hado trenches have gained attention uh, recently uh, because of this, because they will help us understand uh, how communities do live in these harsh environments and also understanding the importance of uh, nutrient inputs uh, and how they interact with Hado communities is very, very important for future studies. So what do we currently know, know about uh, food web connections? So most of our current observations comes from in situ observations, such as this, uh, you can see the super giant amphipod to the right. But these create artificial feeding environments. So as you can see in a second, uh, there's gonna be a uh, cuskeels trying to feed on the super giant amphipod uh, right over there. But these amphipods are attracted to the bait and these eels are, cuskeels are attracted to the amphipod, which is attracted to the bait. So this does not necessarily reflect natural behavior. And also we can do stomach content analysis, but uh, this is incredibly uh, difficult because first of all, they only show the most recently eaten meals of these hato organisms. And also uh, most hato organisms like crustaceans, they go through uh, this feeding process, which involves biting, chewing, and fine scale uh, particle selection, which makes it just incredibly difficult to identify a prey items within the stomach. But luckily, we have stable isotope analysis. So stable isotope analysis is especially useful because it integrates feeding history over longer periods of time, uh, which allows for a more comprehensive uh, analysis of food web studies. And for this particular project, we looked at both Delta 15N, which represents uh, uh, primarily trophic levels and Delta 13C values, which gives more insight on the carbon cycle in the ocean. So for this particular example, I'll show uh, how this works with Delta 15N since it gives insight on food webs. So over here we have small amphipods. So small amphipods are almost like the sardines of deep sea. And let's say if they have a value of about five parts per mil. The predator, typical deep sea shrimp, there is a process called fractionation which happens. And you can think of this as a value increase. And it is widely agreed upon in these habitats that the value increases by about three parts per mil. So the shrimp would have a value of about eight parts per mil. Likewise, a cuskeel, which would prey on the shrimp, with the increase would have a value of about 11 parts per mil. So for this project, we use two types of uh, stable isotope analysis techniques, with one being bulk isotope analysis. And this analyzes the whole animal tissue. And the advantage behind this is that it's very cheap. I think a lot of us involved with, with research knows uh, what financial constraints can lead to but also you can analyze a lot at, at the same time. So it gives like the bigger picture of the food web in the particular habitat. But there's a more refined and expensive version called compound specific isotope analysis. I'll be referring it to it as a CSIA. And this is cool because it uses both source amino acids and trophic amino acids. And source amino acids do not fractionate and trophic amino acids do. So in my prior example, I showed how amino acids, uh, how values fractionate, but this doesn't happen with source amino acids. So as a result, you can actually plug these values in this uh, complicated equation over here, which basically just shows the estimated trophic position. So you don't need a baseline. So you don't have to know what these organisms are necessarily feeding on. You immediately know where they are uh, within their food web uh, based on that estimated trophic position. So our goals for this project was uh, comes in four parts. So one, explore how two HATO food webs compare to one another, two, evaluate organic matter sources, three, compare HATO organisms from surrounding abyssal plains, and four, describe trophic positions and relationships in the Kermadec and Mariana trenches. So these were our study sites. So the Mariana trench is blown up in figure B, and likewise, uh, the Kermadec figure C. And the main takeaway behind this uh, that I want you folks to know is that the Marina Trench is a lot more oligotrophic than the Kermadec Trench based on its location and also proximity to nearby land masses. And also we were able to uh, collect more samples from the Kermadec Trench, but this was simply due to uh, sampling limitations which occurred in the Mariana Trench. So this is our bulk isotope analysis results, Mariana to the left and Kermadec to the right. 
uh, to the x-axis, we have delta 13C, but we'll be focusing more on the y-axis, which is delta 15N. So this is one way you can look at the data, but I actually like to look at it this way. This is a lot easier to see. Uh, now to the right in the criminic trench, you can see the sea cucumbers, the small amphipods, snailfish, uh, rat tail, custodes, and the supergiant amphipods. So one thing to immediately notice from this data is this huge gap in between the sediment and the uh, sea cucumbers uh, to the right in the primitive trench. We didn't really have some for the Marianas. But this basically shows that there might be a missing link in this food web, or the sea cucumbers might not be eating what's concentrated in the sediment at all. So this could be simply due to sampling limitations, and the sediment does not necessarily uh, reflect what these halterings are eating. These guys might be selective feeders. Uh, this is especially pronounced in the Mariana Trench where the gap is a little uh, less uh, large. So maybe it could just be due to the sediment. Another thing to notice is this. So the snailfish and the amphipods are approximately at the same trophic level. Uh, this came as a huge surprise for us because these uh, snailfish are known to be uh, predators of these smaller amphipods from uh, stomach content analysis. And what we thought of that this suggests is two things. So one, these amphipods could be, uh, these snailfishes could be feeding on the gut contents of these amphipods. So you can almost think about them as Chinese dumplings, that the snailfish are really going for the juicy inside rather than the outside. And also another way to look at it is, is that maybe the snailfishes might be actively assimilating the chitin of the amphipods. And for those of you folks who don't know, uh, chitin usually has a lower uh, delta 15 n value, which could be causing this. One interesting thing is guy right here, the super giant. So I think you remember from the prior slides that uh, these guys are not nearly as big as these folks down here, the cuskills and the rat tails. So it's impossible for them to be on top of this, but keep this in mind as we go through the CSIA. Report. And finally, we have this over here in which uh, this was expected. The average values of these organisms were higher than those organisms in the Mariana Trench. And this is simply due to a difference in surface water productivity in the Crimean Trench a lot more uh, productive in the And here are the CSIA results. So to the y-axis, we have trophic level, and to the x-axis, we have the organism name. This is, again, confusing, so I like to look at it this way. So you can easily see that the sea cucumber is to the left, and the rat tail, which is almost like an apex predator of the deep sea, is to the very right. And as you can see over here, the uh, super giant amphipod is indeed in between the uh, rat tails and the sea cucumbers. Oh, some are in between. This basically shows how more refined CSIA uh, actually is and how much more insight it can give to us uh, from food web studies. And lastly, uh, we have uh, this result over here with uh, source amino acids on the x-axis and depth on the y-axis. And this is a huge mess. So what I'd like to point out is that the greens are the opportunistic scavengers of deep sea. So if we remove these, indeed, we can see a nice trend line uh, going through with depth. So the reason behind this increase of source amino acid values is because of microbially we work uh, organic matter and how it tends to increase with depth uh, based on prior studies. So the main takeaways is that uh, there are higher delta 15 n values in the Kremlin Trench, which suggests differences in surface water productivity. Uh, there's a gap. So uh, in delta 15 n values, which suggests feeding selectivity of the sea cucumbers or missing link in the food web. Uh, also an increase in source amino acid values with depth suggests increasing amounts of microbial free working. And four Hato snailfishes might be gaining a substantial amount of nutrients uh, from the amphipod chitin uh, or, or, or and maybe from their material from the digestive tracts of the amphipod. So I know this is a whole bunch to digest, but what I would like you folks to take away with from the one sentence summary is that Hato food webs are just very dynamic. So this is the first time this study has been done beyond the level of just crustaceans. And so this serves as a, an essential building block for more studies in uh, Hato environments. Another way to put this, I guess, is I guess uh, studies of Hato food webs are still indeed in the trenches. So uh, this is very exciting and hopefully more studies will be done on Hato food webs in the near future. Uh, lastly, the acknowledgments. So there is just no word to uh, describe how much gratitude I have uh, for all of these individuals. And uh, really, I came in into college without uh, any knowledge of these things. And these people helped foster that. 
And I would like to thank uh, Jeff and Michael uh, being my father figures in this major, uh, Mackenzie, Brian, Eliana, and Dan for being wonderful co-authors of my paper, and uh, Natalie and Whitney for tremendous help in the laboratory. I would have never been able to analyze those samples without you two. Of course, the Deep Sea, Deep sea Fish Ecology Lab family, uh, undergraduate research opportunities program for all the funding, uh, my wonderful SOAS family, the GES crew and the UOB, and of course, my mom, father, and sister, who's always been advocates of exciting experiences and who truly shaped this uh, wonderful journey I had in college. Thank you so much. All right, feel free to unmute if you'd like to. Congratulations. Good job, Andrew. 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 Okay, uh, questions for Andrew. Oh, no questions. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are gonna get tired of hearing from me. This is Jim again. I'm gonna- Hey Jim. I'm gonna, nice job, Andrew. Um, Thank you. I, I'm curious about this you show this linear relationship with depth between yes. a, like 5,000 and yeah. So is, is there some, you know, at, at least in, in the physical oceanography world, we sort of presume that there's nothing changing between, you know, a couple thousand meters down to the bottom. Yes. Is there some, some process or, or yes. why would we expect that linear? So, Yes, so uh, the, these are uh, very sporadic environments and they're very dynamic uh, because as you may know, these uh, trenches are located uh, mostly near subduction zones. So uh, this could be also due to uh, suspended uh, sediment, which has more microbially reworked matter. And uh, these comes down as, uh, I don't have it on top of my mind, uh, uh, as turbidity flows. So this could be possibly influencing the valleys as well. And that's why we see this uh, this kind of like a trend going down and a higher source amino acid value. So it's simply due to these being dynamic habitats and also uh, matter tends to be more microbially we were with depth in these trenches. If that answers your question. Yeah, so I'm wondering now if, if I mean, you know, we, we've got the hot site as you, as you know, um, not a trench, but you know, there might be some turbidity currents there. You know, we see that at the, through the, through the ACO measurements uh, um, have you looked at any of the any of the data at, at the at the hot side or is you just is that going to be totally totally separate because it's it, it's hard to recall from three years ago I remember I uh, I was uh, I was talking with Fernando about that and uh, he showed me some of the data I kind of really recollect it but uh, it, it, it's just again that this is a different type of environment from the more oligotrophic it is indeed interesting. Another thing that I looked at, uh, which might be interesting to you is like uh, seasonal variation, but uh, it tends to be uh, less of a factor in these extremely deep environments. Sure, yeah, yeah. Hey, hey Jim, this is Jeff. Um, we have samples of sediments now from, uh, and animals from a couple time points at Station Aloha, and those are all in the queue. So it'll be interesting to compare them uh, to some of the other samples we have, but just haven't had a chance yet. Yeah, I, I, I think I saw that on TV, right? Yeah, that was the Voice of the Sea episode. Yep. Since I can't it's another thesis for football. somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Time for one more question. Uh, I, have, I have a question. This is Nicholas. Uh, you yes, you yes. Uh, pointed out the differences between the, uh, the two trenches that you uh, that you looked at uh, and cited the difference to the proximity uh, to uh, land areas. So I just wonder whether you could speculate on the differences that you would expect to a trench that's adjacent to a continent. Would you expect uh, radically different results again? Uh, that, that, that is a very good question. Uh, not sure yet because I haven't seen data personally uh, from more nearby land masses, though, though I do know uh, this, this might be more of an important factor, how these uh, samples were collected. So as you can see in the Mariana Trench, it's kind of like 
across uh, the trench, but on the Kermadec, it's like along the trench axes. And it, it would have been wonderful to get it in a similar pattern, but uh, this was just simply due to sampling limitations. And it could have uh, provided a more additional insight to your question. But it's just, again, uh, sampling limitations. Thank you. And uh, Nicholas, just to augment Andrew's answer, um, we have a bunch of samples from the Atacama Trench, which is butt up against South America. And so we're expecting signals of kelp to uh, change the carbon isotope values, if that's an important source of nutrition to the trench. Thanks. OK. Thank you very much, Andrew. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, Jacob Wagenford, he's going to be talking about the Im potential impacts of OTEC um, on plankton populations in Kaneohe Bay. His mentor is uh, Dr. Brian Powell of the Oceanography Department. Jacob. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Jacob, and uh, today I'm going to be talking through my thesis project on uh, modeling the impacts of uh, OTSEC, or ocean thermal energy conversion, on plankton populations in Kanohe Bay. So first to begin, uh, OTSEC, or ocean thermal energy conversion, is a method of generating power using the temperature difference between the uh, warm surface and the cold deep ocean. So first, warm seawater at about 25 degrees uh, Celsius is uh, used to evaporate a working fluid with a low boiling point, uh, which is typically ammonia. And that vapor then spins a turbine, which uh, generates power uh, similar to a conventional power plant. Then that vapor then makes its way into a condenser where cold seawater at about five degrees Celsius taken from depths at or near a thousand meters are used to cool that vapor back down into a liquid, uh, which is then pumped back in the evaporator and allows the uh, process to repeat. Uh, in a typical 100 megawatt OTEC power plant design, about 320 cubic meters per second of the cold deep water and about 420 cubic meters per second of warm surface water are required for operation. Uh, so why consider OTEC? Uh, while not completely environmentally benign, it has uh, less of an environmental impact compared to a conventional fossil fuel power plants of a similar operating capacity. It also has the potential for consistent power generation due to the con uh, constant presence of that temperature difference between the surface and the deep ocean. And lastly, uh, the potential for limited land usage, which is especially important on islands where uh, land is a valuable and a limited resource and also the home to a lot of the viable sites for OTEC. As I touched on in the last slide, uh, OTEC is not completely environmental benign, and there's a few uh, impacts to consider, uh, first of which is the impingement and entrainment of organisms through both the cold water and the warm water intakes. Organisms taken in through the uh, warm water intakes are expected to have a high mortality rate, and organisms are not expected to survive by being taken in through the cold water intakes. And next, while uh, not Occurring during normal operation, um, there's also the potential for leakage of working fluid the, uh, through possibly natural disasters, which would leak ammonia to the surrounding environment, which can be toxic in significant concentrations. Uh, also thermal shock as that effluent, or I'm sorry, that uh, cold water taken up is usually discharged at a, a, sh a shallower depth than it was taken up at. That cooler effluent can affect uh, thermally sensitive uh, organisms. Uh, there's also the potential for altered nutrient concentrations due to that cold water being enriched in nutrients and discharged at that uh, shallower depth uh, can in turn cause changes to primary productivity. Uh, this last bullet point will be the uh, focus of this project. So the total study area uh, modeled was a 1,400 square kilometer uh, section of water off the windward coast of Oahu. Uh, previous models and studies of OTEC have taken place on the leeward coast uh, due to more favorable uh, bathymetry. However, little is known about the impacts of um, an OTEC point OTEC plant on the uh, windward coast. A uh, simulated OTEC plant was uh, located on Mokapu Point, shown with the red dot on the map. Uh, despite the more favorable bathymetry of the leeward side, uh, this location was chosen due to its proximity to the marine base, as the uh, Navy has been interested in uh, alternative energy. Uh, so the design of the plant itself was a simulated land-based 100 megawatt OTEC plant with a cold water intake uh, right offshore at 1,000 meters depth. The, uh, the warm water and the cold water was a dish, uh, combined and discharged in a mixed discharge at 40 meters depth, as shown with that blue dot on the map. Uh, 
Now, this uh, project had two main objectives, first of which was uh, to model the impacts of a land-based 100 megawatt OTEC plant on the uh, nutrients in the water in and around Kaneohe Bay, and then next to determine if these impacts fall within the natural variability of the area. So in order to address these objectives, a combined system of models was used, the first of which was the Regional Ocean Modeling System, or ROMS, which models the ocean physics in the area, which has a one kilometer horizontal resolution with a 20 uh, terrain falling vertical levels. And now this resolution is uh, rather coarse for the area. However, it's very uh, computationally expensive to run this model. And uh, for the purpose of this uh, project, I was looking at uh, some of the more general impacts uh, to the area as a whole. Uh, this model was then coupled to the uh, Carbon Ocean and Lower Trophics or Cobalt model, which models the ocean biogeochemistry of the area and can simulate various classes of nutrients, uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton. Now this model was run for a period of one year in two cases. The first case uh, with uh, no OTEC plant modeled, uh, which would be called the control case. The second case was run for that same one year period with that presence of that simulated 100 megawatt OTEC plant uh, throughout that duration of one year to compare the differences between uh, the two cases. Uh, so moving into the results, uh, it's a here's a series of plots with the selected variables, nitrate and small plankton, phytoplankton. Uh, nitrate was selected due to the uh, regions uh, New, uh, nitrogen limitation, uh, where a small phytoplankton uh, was selected as a representative of the uh, phytoplankton classes. Uh, so starting on the left is a plot showing uh, the ambient concentration of nitrate uh, surrounding the discharge site in the two cases. So the red showing the control case, the blue line showing the concentration in the OTEC case. Uh, the concentration of the nitrate in the discharge water itself was emitted from this plot as it was several orders of magnitude uh, higher than the ambient concentration surrounding the discharge point. So as we can see uh, throughout most of the year in that OTEC case, uh, there's a higher concentration of nitrate at present. Over on the right is a small phytoplankton with that red line showing the uh, ambient concentration, the surrounding water for the control case, the blue line for the OTEC case, and the black line showing the concentration of uh, phytoplankton directly in that discharge uh, water. So as we can see, there's a lower uh, concentration of uh, phytoplankton at the dish surrounding the discharge site in the OTEC case. Uh, due to that lower concentration of phytoplankton uh, present in the uh, effluent water uh, throughout the one-year period. So moving on next is a series of plots showing a, a vertical cross-section uh, directly seaward uh, from the discharge site. So on the left is uh, showing nitrate. So these uh, differences were normalized by taking the difference between the OTEC and the control cases and then dividing them by the standard deviation of the control case, which I designated as the uh, natural variability of the area. So as we can see on the left, the uh, nitrate, the differences are concentrated uh, more towards the surface and uh, close to the, uh, the discharge site with uh, differences decreasing as we move away uh, deeper and away from the uh, discharge site. We saw about uh, roughly uh, a difference accounting for roughly one and a half times the, um, the standard deviation of the uh, control case. Over on the right, uh, we see that decrease by about a one standard deviation of the control case uh, in small phytoplankton, again, due to that uh, lower concentration uh, being discharged uh, through the effluent water with uh, slight increases in small phytoplankton moving uh, seaward away from the uh, discharge site. Next, our set of figures showing a plan view uh, of the study area for both uh, nitrate and small phytoplankton again with a red value showing a higher concentration present in the OTEC case. And these uh, differences were vertically averaged in the upper 50 meters and then normalized uh, through taking that difference and dividing by the standard deviation of the control case uh, to get that ratio of the differences to the natural variability. So on the left, we see uh, differences approaching 100% of the standard variability uh, right at the discharge site, but decreasing uh, elsewhere with a, between 30 uh, to 50 percent of the natural variability moving away from the discharge site. Uh, in Kaneohe Bay, uh, we saw a lower impact compared to uh, the more open ocean area with about a 5 to 15 percent uh, increase over the, over the natural variability, or sorry, an uh, increase accounting for about 5 to, 5 to 15 percent of the natural variability of the bay itself. On the right, a small phytoplankton, uh, we see a decrease accounting for about 100% of the uh, standard, uh, the uh, natural variability right at that discharge site due to the lower concentration of phytoplankton being discharged uh, with the increases uh, between about 30 and 50% of the uh, natural variability 
as we move away from that discharge site. And in the Bay, uh, with the lowest, some of the lowest impacts with about uh, three to 12% of the uh, natural increases about of the natural variability. So one of the uh, features of this study area I wanted to focus on in particular was uh, Kaneohe Bay. And in order to do this, I took a look at uh, how that excess nitrate uh, being input by that OTEC plant would uh, affect the bay, uh, starting with the flux of nitrate into and out of the bay through the one-year period, uh, with positive values on these plots indicating a flux uh, out of the bay and a negative value indicating a flux of nitrate uh, into the bay. So as we can see, between the control case on the left and the OTEC case on the right, there's a similar pattern of flux. However, the magnitudes differ, with uh, the spikes occurring at the beginning and the end of the year and flux uh, being uh, higher in magnitude in that OTEC case uh, due to that higher concentration of uh, nitrate um, present. So here's an animation of a time period representative of uh, one of those spikes between about day 343 and day 349. Uh, so we can see uh, some identical flow between the uh, two cases, control on the left and OTEC on the right. However, uh, the nitrate concentration uh, that's uh, plotted, we can see there's a uh, more nitrate occurring in the uh, OTEC case on the right. And uh, throughout most of the year, we saw dominant northwestern flow that caused the uh, nitrate to uh, bypass the bay. However, uh, we can see about day 346 that flow shifts a little bit more towards the west and drives some excess nitrate uh, into the bay uh, in both cases. Again, with uh, identical flows, but with a higher magnitude of nitrate going into the bay in, that, uh, in the OTEC case. So to conclude, the uh, strongest impacts were concentrated uh, right at the discharge site with um, impacts decreasing, uh, moving away from, uh, moving deeper and away from that uh, discharge site. Uh, within Kaneohe Bay, uh, we saw the, uh, some of the smallest impacts of the study region with, about, with nitrate uh, increasing overall, accounting for about 3 to 12% of the natural variability. Uh, small phytoplankton uh, increasing as well within the bay, accounting for about 5 to 15% of the natural variability. Uh, overall pattern throughout the region was an increase in near shore nitrate correlating with an increase in small phytoplankton, except right at that discharge point uh, where that, uh, where the uh, OTEC plant was discharging a lower concentration of phytoplankton uh, to the area due to the absence of uh, phytoplankton in the cold water taken up at about 1,000, at about 1,000 meters. And uh, lastly, the patterns of nitrate fluxes were similar between both cases in the bay throughout, throughout some uh, spike events. However, the uh, magnitude was different with uh, more nitrate entering the bay uh, in the uh, OTEC case. Uh, so some of the next steps would be to address some of the longer term effects. This uh, model was run for only a period of uh, one year. Uh, running this model for a longer period uh, could give insight into uh, what impacts this may have on the order of several years or decades. Also impacts to higher trophic levels as the uh, cobalt model is limited to uh, modeling uh, classes of uh, plankton. And although inferences can be made to those effects to the higher trophic levels, I think it would still be helpful to have a model that could um, model the uh, ecosystem as a whole just to see what's going on. And lastly, experimenting with a different design, such as a sea-based OTEC plant instead of a land-based OTEC plant, or having a different capacity OTEC plants rather than one 100 megawatt OTEC plant simulated, having a series of 50 or 25 megawatt OTEC plants and uh, comparing uh, the impacts between those cases. Thank you. Great job, Jacob. If you'd like to unmute and congratulate Jacob, feel free to. Nice job. Congratulations, Jacob. Oh, yeah, brother. Nice. Nice graphs. Congratulations. Good job. Good job, Jacob. Thank you. All right. Uh, questions for Jacob? Again, feel free to unmute or uh, you can enter them into the chat window. Uh, I have a question. This is Nicholas Schneider. Yes. Uh, in your section uh, you, where you showed the nitrate concentrations, if I recall right, there was at about 50 meter steps a uh, reduction uh, in the offshore area. I just wonder what that's caused by. Go back to that slide. Oh, which one was that? Was that uh, one? One more up, I think. Okay, you see on the on your left slide, at about fifty meters in the offshore area, kilometers four kilometers to six, eight kilometers. There's this light blue area. What's going yes. on there? 
Yes, there was a slight reduction there. I'm not too uh, sure what was going on uh, just in that spot there. That was that was uh, present in just uh, that depth layer uh, throughout some of the study area. I'm not sure what was causing that uh, decrease, potentially um, that uh, increase in uh, small phytoplankton was occurring offshore uh, could be consumed, uh, uptake in more of that you know, nitrate in that area that might not be you know, reaching there due to uh, some of the flow in that area. But, um, okay, good. Okay, great, thanks. Jacob, this is Jeff. Um, I was just curious, you know, we, we have nutrient influxes into Kanyoe Bay naturally, and I was just curious if you have looked at the magnitude of the potential nutrient fluxes you've, you've documented here, what would happen to Kanyoe Bay? Do, do we know based on the literature what effect that would have on the reefs or the ecosystem within the bay? Um, looking at, uh, well, with the, uh, you know, some of the excess nitrate, uh, we can see, um, you know, like following similar to uh, what happens after a storm events with that nutrient loading, uh, potentially uh, increases in, uh, you know, some of the phytoplankton uh, with a lag of about, you know, a few days to uh, several weeks, uh, potentially seeing a plankton blooms, uh, which could be exacerbated by, you know, some of that excess nitrate that's going in. Uh, so, you know, potentially occurring at similar times uh, to uh, what naturally happens, but uh, maybe uh, exacerbated uh, due to that. So, hydration. so I guess what I was asking you to do is to speculate a little bit on, on, effects beyond the nitrate and phytoplankton that you looked at. So what other sort of real consequences might the people who use the bay experience if this were to occur? Right, they probably won't care about phytoplankton, right? Right, uh, higher constant or um, potentially if the bloom is significant enough, uh, could see uh, some oxygen depletion uh, with, uh, you know, the heightened, uh, you know, magnitude of the blooms uh, possibly occurring. Um, as well as, you know, if the if it's only um, you know some a minor increase above you know what naturally happens potentially seeing um, you know a higher population higher populations of you know plankton and then cascading up you know trophic levels and possibly seeing a, a higher abundance maybe thanks if there's a chat uh, question why is there such a large spike in nitrogen in the winter months oh in the winter in the uh, winter months, uh, we saw uh, uh, some shifting uh, currents, uh, which was uh, pushing uh, some more of that nitrate into the bay with some uh, with a higher uh, frequency of uh, some more uh, western uh, currents that were forcing the uh, nitrate into Kanawha Bay. Any other questions for Jacob? All right, great job, Jacob. Thank you. Okay, our last speaker today is Corey Wong, and he's gonna be giving us a little bit of a history of CZM management in Hawaii and, re and reviewing options uh, for our managed retreat, retreat uh, from the shoreline. So Corey. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for sticking it out to the last presentation. Uh, for the duration of my presentation, I will be shutting off my camera to optimize some video playback. Um, so here we go. Alrighty, so today my presentation is going to focus on an analysis of managed retreat options in response to sea level rise here in Hawaii. The structure of this talk uh, will begin by answering the question, what is managed retreat? Then look at a brief overview of the current environment, uh, legal environment here in Hawaii. We will then discuss how setbacks can be used as a catalyst for retreat before diving into managed retreat policy tools. And finally ending with a conclusion, looking at our pathway forward. So what is managed retreat? Well, functionally, managed retreat is migrating development and people away from hazardous areas such as coastlines to a safe area, typically at higher elevation or further back from the coastline. But in practice, managed retreat involves an extensive list of policies aimed at incentivizing or assisting relocation or disincentivizing through regulations the further development or redevelopment in coastal areas. 
In the context of my thesis, the end goal of managed retreat is to protect public trust beaches from erosion and loss. Now, the environmental factor really driving the need for retreat is sea level rise. Currently, we are experiencing a global sea level rise rate of 3.42 millimeters a year. In Hawaii, this is expected to increase to eight millimeters a year by 2100. These uh, increasing sea level rise rates will cause coastlines to become increasingly hazardous to occupy and where hardening exists, it will cause beach loss. When discussing managed retreat options, it's important to first understand the current uh, legal environment. So today in Hawaii, the political climate is characterized by the creation of state and county climate change commissions, state reports on sea level rise and managed retreat amongst others. Most recently, we saw the passing of Senate Bill 2060, amending the State Coastal Zone Management Policy, HRS 205A, to prohibit private shore protection structures and also expanding protections to beaches as coastal and coastal sand dunes. So all of this really shows a flurry of recognition of sea level rise impacts and indicates the existence of the proper political setting for implementing retreat but we still have a serious challenge in how shoreline communities uh, respond. Before diving into managed retreat policy tools, let's take a look at how creating strong setback statutes are a vital preliminary step to catalyzing managed retreat. So strong setback policies can act as a catalyst by creating a legal and regulatory environment that reaches the following goals. One, lowering uh, real estate values to accurately reflect the hazards of sea level rise. Two, setting a legal precedent that homeowners will not be permitted shore protection structures, and at the very least, forcing them to consider retreat. And three, when houses are no longer protected, this compels government to confront the issues of retreat and create financial solutions to support it. Uh, to support these goals, we recommend amendments to Honolulu shoreline setback statutes as follows. One, design a place appropriate setback regime that includes erosion based setbacks using uh, existing policy frameworks from Maui and Kauai counties. Two, prohibit the construction of private seawalls to align with the new statewide regulations. And three, prohibit the repair of uh, legacy seawalls. So in the scope of possible managed retreat policy techniques, uh, revamping sections of Honolulu shoreline setbacks is a necessary step that is low effort, that is a fairly low effort objective and it's scientifically sound and legally acceptable. So now we'll dive into some, but not all of the managed retreat policy tools that I discovered through my research. We'll begin with property buyouts. In the United States, uh, federal property buyouts are the primary method for government assistance when it comes to retreat. Because they are often post-disaster, it's hard to consider these a form of managed retreat. Uh, there's also nearly zero examples of federal buyouts of properties due to hazards of sea level rise, such as chronic erosion and flooding. Uh, and these are the main concerns here in Hawaii. It's important to note that funding for buyouts are allocated from state and local hazard mitigation plans, which display the government's intent in terms of how hazard mitigation funding will actually be used. Uh, so how does this play into the prospect of using buyouts for retreat? Because there is no intent set forth by either the state or Honolulu hazard mitigation plans to use federal funding for buyouts, it's uh, our opinion that it's highly unlikely buyouts will occur at least in the near future. Uh, this is likely due to the expensive cost of coastal real estate, which makes buying out these properties extremely financially irresponsible. Um, there are also moral and ethical issues regarding spending government funding for buyouts, which creates a safety net assurance. Uh, this is the idea that the property owners who enter into the risky investment of buying a coastal property are not the ones who will bear the financial cost if the risks manifest. And because of this, uh, at least as in terms of now, we don't recommend the use of property buyouts for managed retreat. Uh, so now we'll look at uh, what are known as transferable development rights. In this policy tool, coastline property owners sell their development rights to developers in the urban core. Uh, rights are sold as TDR credits in the form of conservation easements and are proportional to a property's lot size. 
Now this would work by the county creating a TDR program consisting of a TDR bank that acts as a marketplace for the sale of credits between homeowners and developers. And to sell TDR credits, governments require homeowners or could at least uh, require homeowners to remove all existing structures. And by purchasing TDR credits, developers in the urban core acquire rights to increase their development density through extra units. And there's a lot of benefits to using TDR, uh, TDR programs. Uh, they keep the cost within the private market. Uh, there's a substantial financial incentive to drive the retreat of coastal homeowners. A TDR program would also align with city goals to increase density in the primary urban core, such as Kaka'ako. And maybe most significantly, TDR credits maintain their value uh, for both unprotected and protected houses and are not affected by laws prohibiting shore protection structure. Um, because of all these benefits, this uh, transferable, the right, uh, transferable development rights comes along with a high recommendation. Uh, so our next uh, managed retreat policy tool is mortgage contingent loans. And these are a retreat policy whereby homeowners relinquish their property titles to the government and in return receive a low interest loan from or backed uh, by the government to buy a property elsewhere. The loan would be capped at a proportion of the value of the property not subject to sea level rise hazards. Um, interestingly enough, there was actually an attempt by legislators to pass a mortgage contingent loan program which would have created the uh, Hawaii Beach Preservation Fund. And this fund would gain monies through an increase in real estate conveyance taxes and monies gained back from the loans. There are some limitations though to this technique. Uh, it might be limited to unprotected houses because a low interest loan might not be enough financial incentive to drive the retreat of houses that um, are continued, are safe behind a seawall. Um, they also might be limited to houses that are fully owned where the owners don't have outstanding mortgage payments. Uh, despite these limitations, there are also uh, a lot of benefits. There's a general, generally there's a less cost to taxpayers and the program should pay for itself over time. Um, there's a high to moderate financial incentive for driving retreat, moderate because it does not provide as much financial incentive compared to TDR programs. Um, and in the end, government acquires the land, ensuring its use as conservation lands. Uh, because of this, we recommend mortgage contingent loans as a policy technique. So the last approach is a theoretical method um, whereby governments pay homeowners to lease their property contingent on the removal of structures by the owner. The government would prohibit the potential to rebuild as well. Uh, so the government pays an easement until the specified time uh, based upon providing homeowners with the reasonable means for relocation or other factors like the rezoning of property. Uh, in the end game is that as the shoreline migrates inland and land switches to public ownership and over time as land use changes rezoning to conservation land, um, the homeowner at the end also maintains uh, ownership which depending on what viewpoint you have is a benefit or a drawback. Uh, there are some limitations to this method as well. As mentioned before, uh, with mortgage contingent loans here, these might be limited to unprotected houses. There's also, uh, this method doesn't offer any solution to how this would be funded. Uh, some benefits, this would allow the government to spend its, uh, uh, spread its financial burden over time. And there's less upfront uh, cost and buyouts or mortgage contingent loans. It's also our belief that this uh, method offers a high financial incentive. And because of all this, we do recommend this as a managed retreat policy tool. So let's look at our pathway forward. It's a theme among many of the retreat options that they are limited to unprotected houses. And because of this, it's necessary to phase out seawalls in order to retreat a meaningful amount of properties. And to do this, we first our first recommendation would be to amend Honolulu's county setback ordinance. Now, in terms of recommendations regarding financial assistance, we first recommend a TDR program because it keeps the cost in the private market. 
and aligns with city goals to redirect, redirect development to the primary urban core while providing substantial financial assistance to both unprotected and protected houses for retreat. Now, in terms of mortgage contingent loans versus the leasing approach, uh, mortgage contingent loans provide a better end result in that the land is switched to government ownership and also in the long run, it may be of less cost to the government. But the question is if a low interest loan is a large enough financial incentive for homeowners to retreat. Now the leasing approach has a slightly weaker end result in terms of managed retreat in that the land remains in private ownership until the certified shoreline migrates far enough inland, but it may offer a more substantial financial incentive for homeowners. Because of all these economic and incentive based unknowns, it is highly recommended that the state produce a study on the economics of each approach and the implications of using a combination of approaches. And lastly, regardless of the chosen approach, uh, it's imperative that there is an equitable operationalization of managed retreat at a broad scale with applicability to, uh, applicability to shorelines of varying geologies, backshore development, and uh, community dynamics. In other words, we have to use a standardized method of implementation that doesn't discriminate against unmeasurable factors of the coastlines. So to answer the questions of when and where do we use managed retreat, um, we suggest prioritizing shoreline sections with backshore sand deposits. And also in terms of when, it, it would be best to engage in managed retreat uh, discussions or agreements uh, on various shorelines when a specified amount of erosion has occurred, prioritizing critically eroded shorelines. Um, lastly, there now exists the appropriate social and political environment to undertake a comprehensive managed retreat effort. So we believe it's in of utmost importance to, to do this as soon as possible, really. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'd like to give a big mahalo to my mentor, Chip Fletcher, uh, my friend and mentor, Christian McDonald, uh, McKenna Kaufman, my thesis reviewer, and to my family seen here in this awkward Christmas card photo. And also a special thanks to Dr. Gidry, Lentina Villa, uh, Coastal Geology Group, and all of my GES peers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Corey. Please feel free to unmute and congratulate Corey. Good job, Corey. Good job, Corey. Awesome job, Corey. Great job, Corey. Corey you, you crushed that, Corey. Congrats. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have time for questions for Corey. Any uh, questions from the audience? Either unmute or enter them into the chat box. I have a question uh, for Corey. Did you look up at, at the startup costs for each of the um, policy methods? Like how much would it cost, say, like Honolulu versus Maui to implement um, these different measurements? Yeah, so I did take into account, you know, thinking about the operation costs of each of these programs. I didn't specifically, just because of the scope of Magic Treat is so large, I didn't specifically look at the cost. Um, but the good thing is in a lot of these, uh, they have mechanisms to generate revenue um, in a way that over time, that, that would make up for the startup costs. But it is a good point, you know, looking at how much it would cost uh, just to run one of these uh, in the beginning, but no, I did not as in the, as to answer your question. Um, I, I have a question. This is Nicholas Schneider. Um, one of the, one of the beneficiaries of a shoreland retreat are those properties that are now the new shore, uh, new properties right on the, on the waterline. So the second or third row. So is there any idea of tapping into that increase in property values to finance the shoreline retreat? Uh, that's a good point. Uh, I didn't look at that. Are, are you are you mainly referring to the sale of those properties or through property? It could be sale, it could be tax wise, it could yeah. be number wise, meaning that the value of these properties increase. That I don't that, that's a good point. I don't foresee that increase in, in property tax being substantial just because 
uh, or, or it could make up for the property tax lost from retreating the front row houses right now. I didn't think of that it in that way, but that is, all, that is actually a, a good argument to support managed retreat that now these second row houses will become uh, beachfront properties, uh, sort of replacing that void of tax, uh, property tax that you've lost, but you still lost those front row houses. So that is also something that I took into account uh, in my complete thesis. Hey, Corey, this is Noah. Uh, I have a question for you. Hey, what's up? So uh, first off, I think this is a pretty like fascinating and complex issue that you're trying to address here. And I, I believe that Kauai County has more stringent building standards along the coast compared to Honolulu County. So have they looked into this any further than uh, the suggestions you've made or have they tried to implement anything like that? Uh, so yeah, you're correct. Maui and Kauai County have pretty pro like extremely progressive shoreline setbacks in term and and coastal development regulations. So that was my first recommendation, you know, for Honolulu County to follow suit and just use the policy framework as an example. In terms of manage looking specifically at manage retreat options, the only the only government sanctioned report in terms of why that I'm aware of is the state report which looked sort of at a broad high level picture of managed retreat it didn't it, it basically just ended with suggesting more research and didn't really come to any solution or provide necessarily any specific further actions to take and i don't think there's any county level um, but within some of these techniques for example um tdr programs maui county actually has put forth research and shown interest and intent in using a TDR program in the Maui County general plan as, as a means to finance retreat. But in policy, they tend to stay away from using the term manage retreat because it's so volatile and it just scares everyone away. So it's hard to find a specific reports on manage retreat. Okay, thank you, Corey. Corey, I have a, a speculation question for you. Um, so I guess bear with me for a little bit. So my understanding is um, when we have uh, coastal disasters, natural disasters, FEMA comes in and they splash a lot of money around uh, to offset the problems. If that's the case, what, how do you think how do you think if, if the federal government made adjustments to what FEMA could do um, for coastal property owners and that maybe this protection that's effectively afforded them were either removed or it was, uh, you know, you can build there, but, you know, only rebuild once or we, you, you know, we're not going to give as much money. How might that drive if there were changes in that that, that sort of disincentivize coastal development um, or also the rebuild of what's already there. How, how might that drive what you're talking about here? You know, it's a, 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 a countrywide problem that federal funding is used to uh, post-disaster federal funding or hazard mitigation funding is used to basically finance the rebuild of properties in the area in, in the same areas which are increasingly hazardous due to climate change. For example, post, post hurricane uh, communities oftentimes receive federal funding to just build in the same place only to get destroyed a few years later. Uh, in terms of disincentivizing that, I don't have too many solutions to offer you to be honest. Um, I'm sure if I thought about it for a little, but, but you also bring up another point um, that me and, and Dr. Fletcher discussed, which kind of came up after I wrote my, my whole thesis, is that um, within the, the guidelines of how to use federal hazard mitigation fundings, uh, they, they might be expanding that to, to better or, or to include sea level rise hazards such as chronic erosion and um, uh, 
uh, chronic flooding from sea level rise. Um, but I mean, I could imagine putting stipulations in that that would disallow further building, uh, not using that money to build on the same property. But yeah, that's about as far as I can offer an answer for you. Yeah, do you, do you think if those things happened at a federal level that it would further incentivize some of these approaches that you just discussed sort of indirectly? Uh, if, if federal funding increased or expanded to, to sea level rise hazards? More so if the, if the federal government would not uh, put the bill for damages caused by uh, these storm events, do you think that indirectly would incentivize it is pure speculation, but do you think that would incentivize um, these options that you've been discussing today? Do you think the state would have more impetus to try to get something done? Yeah, yeah, I do. But it, it really comes down to how the state is going to allocate that federal funding. And it doesn't seem that currently the state sees using that funding for buyouts is, uh, is responsible. Um, but yeah, I think if you took away the capability of homeowners to look to the federal government for bailing them out when, when critical destructive erosion occurs and that'll force them to look for other options. Okay, thank you. Anyone else, you have time for one more question? There's another question. Yeah, this is Jim, kind of following on that. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about, you know, these these events come uh, in sort of discrete, uh, you know, let's say a hurricane comes. Um, is there the possibility that this would get he held up and, and people would say, well, this is not a function of sea level rise and climate change. This was a function of a storm event. Mm. You know, I haven't really, th that's a good, that's a good way to bend, bend, you know, bend the rules for lack of better term to, acquire funding. I mean, if you could prove to the federal government that it was an occurrence based upon a one-time natural disaster, uh, possibly you'd be able to acc accrue some funding. Uh, that's actually a pretty witty way around it, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not so sure that that would work unless, you know, there was actually to be a major hurricane that landed on, um, cross through the islands. And I don't know if that would work for just normal high storm waves on North Shore either, but it's a good point. Well, one, one more small question, Corey, the, the family picture, the, in your family look happy, but the dog looks a little feisty. Is that, is that the normal or? Yeah, she's a bit challenged. So she didn't know she had to smile. <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. This concludes uh, our uh, fall 2020 symposium. We're going to leave the meeting room open uh, for the presenters to chat with anyone if, if anyone wants to stick around. Um, otherwise, uh, have a great end of the semester for all the students. Uh, do well next week in your final exams. Um, everyone stay safe and practice the measures that's keeping our rates fairly low in Hawaii uh, for COVID and happy holidays, everyone.